Hello and welcome to Franklin Covey's On Leadership Series. My name is Scott Miller. I serve as your weekly host and interviewer. Today, great conversation with a friend of mine, Dory Clark, who is the best-selling author of numerous books, including the Inc. number one book recently published called Stand Out, How to Find Your Breakthrough Idea and Build a Following Around It. Dory Clark is a nationally acclaimed branding and marketing strategist and expert. Dory, welcome to On Leadership. Scott, I'm so glad to have the opportunity to chat with you. Thanks. Great to have you on. You've written quite a few books. I'm very excited to kind of have our journey today. I'd love to start, Dory, with why you wrote this book. I love some of your previous ones, Reinventing You and around, around Entrepreneurship. Why did you write Stand Out? I wrote Stand Out, Scott, because I actually wanted to solve a, a problem for myself in some ways. Uh, I, I trained as a journalist, and so the, the way that I like to solve problems in a lot of cases is by asking a lot of really smart people, learning from them, and then synthesizing those answers. And so something that uh, that early on in, in my business, I was really curious about, you know, I have my own company doing uh, marketing strategy consulting, and I wanted to understand why do some people succeed in differentiating themselves in the marketplace? Why is it that some people become known as thought leaders and get widely respected and get their ideas heard and other people just kind of languish. And so I really wanted to try to analyze what makes someone a recognized expert in their industry or in their field or in their company. And so I, I set out to, to figure that out. So I interviewed people in a broad spectrum of fields, everything from, from business to genomics to real estate to urban planning, to try to crack that code and reverse engineer it and then share the results that I learned in, in the book that became Stand Out. So back to the book in just a moment, because I know you interviewed over 50 people. I want to hear more about that. You have, without dispute, had a remarkable career. I've followed it. I have some sense for it. Will you take us on a couple of minute journey? Check your humility, because our audience loves to kind of hear how people got from one point to another. Will you kind of walk us through some of the highlights and be specific on some of the things you've been able to be involved in? Absolutely. I'll, I'll give you the highlights and the lowlights. <laughs> so I, the, the basic path, Scott, after I finished college, I, uh, I went straight into grad school, I actually um, went to divinity school for, uh, for a couple of years and got a master's of theological studies from Harvard Divinity School. And my original thought was that I wanted to go into academia, but I ended up uh, not getting into the doctoral programs that I wanted to. So I had to come up with a plan B. So that was how I entered journalism. And uh, that was a, a good fit in many ways because I love, I love reading and writing and asking questions and learning things. But unfortunately, it was right around the time that the journalism industry started collapsing. So after about a year, I got laid off, couldn't find a, a job as a, as a journalist. So I had been a political reporter, and I ended up switching into, into actually being in politics. Uh, so I worked as a, a spokesperson on a governor's race, and then a spokesperson on a presidential race. Um, I always hasten to note, not the most recent one. <laughs> and uh, I, uh, I did that for, for a while, but my candidates kept losing. Uh, so you know, a lot, of, a lot of trials and tribulations in my 20s. Um, then I, I went and ran a nonprofit for a couple of years. And in the course of running the nonprofit, I had this revelation along the way that basically running a nonprofit is the same thing as running a business. And so the light bulb went off and I decided that I would run my own business. And so for the past uh, decade plus, I've had my own consulting firm and, uh, and kind of all the constellation of activities that go with it from writing books to, to giving talks and, uh, and sharing ideas in forums like this. Great journey, but you've piqued my interest. Our viewers want to know, tell us about a lesson you learned on the, the governor's campaign and a lesson you learned on the presidential campaign and share us the names of those campaigns. We have some context as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So uh, for the, the governor's race that I worked on, it was uh, for Robert Reich, the former U.S. Labor Secretary, who some folks may know. He's uh, definitely over the years been uh, a bit of a, a media personality. He's uh, certainly great at spreading and expressing ideas. Uh, so he ran for governor of Massachusetts in 2002 and uh, did, not, uh, did not win. Uh, unfortunately, he did not make it past the, the primary. So a, a lesson that I learned on that campaign campaign was probably that um, it, it was about the 
the challenges of a crowded field. I think this is something mm. that's interesting right now. We see uh, in the in the presidential uh, race that's taking shape in 2020, the Democrats yeah. have a ton of candidates that are that are running. Uh, and there's, I think, sometimes a real danger in concentrating more on your primary opponents than uh, on who your eventual uh, person is from the other party that you're running against. Sometimes that can maybe take your eye off the ball. Um, so it's, it's worth keeping both of those things in mind. In uh, the presidential race that I worked for, it was the 2004 cycle, and I worked for Howard Dean when he ran. Uh, that was quite a ride. He, uh, as, as folks who followed the race at the time may remember, had an almost meteoric rise. He really right. um, went from nowhere, you know, just being a non-factor in the race, to working his way up quite rapidly to become the front runner, only, unfortunately, to kind of crash and burn at the last minute. A lot of people attribute that to his uh, so-called Dean scream right. uh, in, in Iowa. Uh, but really, I, I think the interesting thing there for me is that oftentimes the, the quick answer is the wrong answer. Uh, the, the Dean scream certainly did not help. Uh, it was sort of you know this this media thing that was on on a loop on CNN 24 hours a day where he was kind of yelling at the at the top of his lungs at a rally. But the truth was the da the die was cast before that. Um, the entire context for it was that he had been expected to be the winner in Iowa, and instead he finished uh, a very disappointing third place. And that was more than anything, I think, what set it uh, what set it in motion that the uh, the ground game was was not uh, sufficiently robust there. So really, the lesson that I learned from there is that um, what many people casually think of as being the cause sometimes uh, is, is actually a distraction and is, and is not really what the precipitating factor is. It's a great insight. You could write a memoir at, at, at a young age already right, from your experiences. <laughs> Let's talk about stand out. So you talk, us, talk to us about the types of people you interviewed, the number, what were some of the key insights you gleaned from all this research and interviews you, you did to come up with the book Stand Out? Yeah, so one of the key things that I learned in the process of standout is that when it comes to sharing your ideas in the world with the world, there's really a, a three-step process involved. And what I, uh, the way that I describe it is build your network, build your community, and uh, is actually sorry, uh, build build your network, build your audience, and then build your community. Right. And what I mean by that with these with these three steps is first of all, it's it's about a network, kind of a, a smaller, tighter knit group. And the reason that this is so essential as your starting point is that as you're formulating your ideas, it, you know, for obvious reasons, you're you're testing them out. You're seeing what works. You're seeing what actually resonates with people and is a genuinely new insight. You don't want to go massively public in the early stages before you actually have something. And so something that often uh, d doesn't get enough play, really, is the importance of having a tight-knit, trusted group of people around you to actually help you vet those ideas and make them better. So, I mean, I think so many people these days in this kind of internet-driven era are a, a little bit isolated. I mean, they might have the casual encounters online or something like that, but I, I really believe in, in the value of deep connections with a small group, especially early on, to test your ideas with that network. Now, the second phase is the importance of building your audience. Because if you have, if you have a great idea and you share it with a, a group of people, that's wonderful. But it's not going to be sufficient in the end. You have to get it out to people who don't already know you. That's, that's how something can take flight. So you need to begin sharing it more publicly with this audience. And that could be through starting to speak about it, uh, through writing, through blogging, through doing a podcast or a video series like this. But somehow you need to give a, a way or a vehicle for people who are not already familiar with your work to find you. And then third and finally is the step that I call building a community. Because ultimately, if you want your ideas to spread, if you think that they are valuable enough that they really can help the world and, and you want uh, to share them, it can't all be about you. You as an individual, no matter how powerful, can only take it so far. You need to get a community of people who are all talking about something and sharing about something. So you have to find a way to, to really build a community, whether it is in person through things like meetups or conferences, 
maybe it's online through, uh, you know, anything from a Facebook group or a LinkedIn group or some kind of a listserv. The vehicle doesn't matter, but you've got to be able to bring people together around the idea. When you have that, things can really gain traction and spread far beyond what you might imagine. Dory, the book is an excellent book as it relates to helping understand how to build your brain, which is your expertise. You share an insight as it relates to thought leadership, and you kind of define what a thought leader is and what isn't. Would you share your own uh, perspective on that? Yeah, definitely. You know, it's in interesting. A few years ago, I did a podcast interview uh, for, for Harvard Business Review for their IdeaCast, specifically talk, talking about the idea of thought leadership and even the phrase, because there's a lot of blowback sometimes. Some people don't like the phrase thought leader. They think it's pretentious. Or, and, and honestly, it can be when it's used in the wrong way meaning you will see a lot of people on their LinkedIn profile or their website, and they'll say, I am a thought leader. And I, I think that the trouble there is that I, I believe strongly uh, being a thought leader is something that you you really can't call yourself. It's like, it's like crowning yourself king or right. something like that. You need to be a thought leader in the eyes of other people. That's what matters is do other people view you that way. So I would urge people, don't designate yourself as a thought leader, but Simultaneously, I, I think that it is worth all of us, if, if we feel called to do it, to strive to be a thought leader, to strive to be the kind of person that is worthy of that designation. And the reason that I actually still believe in the concept, even if I don't believe in people you know, saying that about themselves, is that there's something noble about it. I mean, if you literally break it down, thought leader, first of all, it, you know, thought, right? It, it implies very importantly, that you are recognized for your ideas. You are not recognized just because you're famous or because of some shallow measure of celebrity. You are respected because of your ideas. That matters. And the second piece, thought leader, well, of course, right? You can't be a leader unless someone is willing to follow you. And so there's a real meritocracy in many ways. If, you're, if your ideas are not compelling enough, people are not going to follow you. So being a thought leader in the genuine sense, if other people say, you know, yes, Scott, I love what you're doing. I, I am willing to listen more, to learn more from you. That's, that's kind of an amazing place to be and something that I think is, is worth us working toward. Story, great insight. I, I've read the book. I think it's extraordinarily practical for people like me that are, you know, that are working to build a brand for their firm, that are trying to come up with some, you know, useful points of view. You share a concept I think is very valuable. I want you to riff on it. And it's about, you know, telling stories that aren't being told. You know, what is your unique perspective? Talk a bit about why that's valuable and what people can do to think about. So what is my story that hasn't been told yet by someone else? Yeah, thank you, Scott, for, for bringing that up. One of the things that I talk about in Stand Out is, is the question of how do you, how do you find ideas that, that really are worth talking about? Because I, I think a problem for a lot of people, they may be a smart, talented professional, but so often people look at themselves and say, yeah, but what do I have to offer that's different than anybody? Like, yeah, I might be, I might be smart, I might be good at what I do, but, but how is it different? You know, why should people listen to me? And it's a really common phenomenon because the truth is we are our own definition of normal, right? Anything about us, like we're the baseline. Oh, of course, everybody, everybody does that. And it's only later that we find out, oh, wait, everybody doesn't do that. That might actually be a, a unique thing. So one way to begin to, to look at this and to excavate it, certainly, you know, going back to the theme about your, your network, oftentimes it's your friends and your trusted colleagues that can shine a light for you on things about you that are different or unique or, or special. It's, it's very, very hard for us to see that ourselves. Um, but the second thing where it can be a useful place to experiment is to think about aspects of your background that are, or your perspective somehow, that are different than what is common or what is standard in your field. And the reason I say this, so often in our professional life, we are taught to think of our differences as weaknesses. Oh, everybody knows more about blah, blah than me, or everybody's been doing this for 20 years and I just started. And we, and we think, oh, that's, that's a handicap that, that we're dealing with. But the truth is, almost always, you have not just been you know, sitting on the couch eating bonbons for 20 years. You have been doing something. And that something is different and has given you a different perspective that may actually be uniquely valuable. And so if you can look at that point of differentiation, it, 
it can actually really be a, a source of strength rather than a weakness. Just as a, a quick example, there's a guy that I profile in Standout named Eric Schott, who has become one of the leading thinkers in biology today. Right. He's published more than 200 peer-reviewed papers on everything from Alzheimer's disease to diabetes. But what was fascinating about him is that he did not, his field now is biology, but he didn't start in biology. He was actually a computer scientist and only later in his career moved into biology. And the special sauce he was able to bring was was that because he had trained in, in quantitative methods and computer science, he became one of the first people to really understand the promise of big data in biology. Now, you know, nowadays every everybody's like, oh yeah, big data, that's important. But back back in the early days, biologists were like, what is this? You know, they, they, they hadn't trained in it, they didn't get it, they didn't know how to do it. And Eric brought it in and said, wait a minute, we've been doing this in computer science for a long time. This could really be helpful. And so he was able to see its importance before everyone else, which made him a breakthrough thinker. So what you're saying is, is real estate moguls can become the president of the United States, right? <laughs> it, it seems, Scott, that may be the case, yes. <laughs> hey, one of the reasons we interviewed you is because you are an enormously abundant thought leader. I get to designate you that. I read your books. Your website is rich with uh, articles and downloadable tools. And I, we love people like you that are just here to spread your ideas and share what's worked and not worked with you. One of those tools is called Dory Clark's Recognized Expert Evaluation Toolkit. I took it and downloaded it. In essence, it is an evaluation of how ready I am to sort of you know, stand out. I, I took the quiz. Before I give you my sort of aggregate score, I want you to share with the audience What's the purpose of the tool? Why did you create it? And what should people learn from it after they've taken it and printed it off? Yeah, thank you, Scott. I appreciate it. So I actually created uh, this, this tool in, uh, in, in collaboration with, uh, with a lot of the people who were part of the pilot cohort of this right. online program that I run. It's called the Recognize Expert course. And what I discovered in the course of writing my books and, and years of studying this is that fundamentally when it comes to becoming a recognized expert, there are three key levers that people need to keep their eyes on. Um, the first, we were talking about this earlier, is your network. The second is content creation so that you can actually share your ideas and people will know what your ideas are. And the third is a concept called social proof, which is basically, you know, what is what is your credibility? What are the, what are the factors that other people can look at quickly to ascertain whether you are somebody worth paying attention to. Now, of course, we, you know, we might like to live in a world where everybody really takes lots of time and thought to evaluate if you're worth paying attention to, but folks are often looking for shortcuts. And so social proof is, is a way to help aid that process so that your message is more likely to be heard. So I created this tool so that folks in both in my recognized expert program and folks who are interested beyond that um, can can access it and really score themselves on each uh, metric so that they can understand if they want to become a recognized expert in their field, what are the areas where they're strong and what are the areas where they may want to focus more energy so that they can raise the bar on those levels and make it more likely that their great ideas will get out into the world. You know, Dory, it was easy, but like uber practical. I actually really enjoyed it. And I'm going to ask you to guess my score in just a moment. I think your ranking was from 0 on up to 107. And here were the categories. From 0 to 20, if that's your score, you're kind of, quote, on your way. You're in the early phases of building your brand as an expert. Uh, from 20 to 40, you called it ramping up. You're starting to take the right next, the night, right next steps. You're experimenting. And then the next phase is 40 to 65, you call it gaining traction. Key elements are in place, you're establishing it with a broader audience, and then 65 to 85, wink, wink, is called on the verge. You call that, you're making progress, you're beginning to see the results of your work, and then 85 to 107, you know, you've hit the gold, the gold mine, you're a recognized expert. Uh, guess what my score was? All right, Scott, you, you are doing a great job. I mean, certainly you're knocking it out of the park with content creation uh, because you are, you're plugging away and, and doing this podcast slash video series. Um, I have to imagine your network is, uh, is really pretty strong. Come on, give me the score, and give me the score, give me the score. Ha! All right, let's call, it, let's call it 72. 71, nice job. 71, Ooh, all right. Yeah. But what I found so practical is it helped me think about, you have, you have a big focus on frequency, right? Every, almost every question 
is gauged by how frequently are you posting? Are you networking? Are you sharing and giving back? Why were you so focused on frequency as sort of the value indicator on these 20 plus questions? Yeah, it's, I'm glad you raised the, the point, Scott. There's, there's two thoughts I'll share about that. The first actually comes from my experience working in politics, you know, where you, where you started. There is a, a, a saying that is commonly cited in politics, which is that a voter needs to hear your name seven times before they will even consider voting for you. Wow. And, you Scott know, that's, Miller, that's why Miller, there's Scott so much Miller, repetition. Scott Miller, Scott Miller, it's, you know, Scott oh, Miller. you see the yard sign, you, uh, you get the direct mail, you hear the radio ad. And so in a crowded and noisy environment, you really need to have repetition. You know, somebody seeing one blog post of yours, even if it's great, they're not, they're not necessarily gonna clue in, oh, Scott right. Miller wrote that. Right. Uh, it takes a, a lot of time. So repetition is important for that reason. The second is that there, there is a compound effect, kind of a snowball effect that's, that's important. Uh, in my most recent book called Entrepreneurial You, there was a, a guy that I profiled named Antonio Centeno who built a, a big uh, following on uh, on YouTube uh, and for his blog called Real Men Real Style. He's a men's fashion advisor. And the way he was able to build it was that he did a video every single day that was men's style tips. Mm. And when I talked to him about it, he, and I said, well, you know, you've, you've obviously had a lot of success. What was the biggest mistake that you made in your business? And he knew it, hands down. He said, oh, that's easy. He said there was a period of time where he had gotten up to, I guess, a couple hundred thousand subscribers on his YouTube channel, and he, he got a little complacent. And so he had been doing daily videos, and instead he switched to doing it you know, every couple of weeks. And he said that was, that was a terrible mistake. If he had to do it over again, he would absolutely not have stopped. He said every day is critical. He said he, he thought that he would have scaled to, you know, to a million plus much faster if he had kept up the daily thing because there's such a huge benefit algorithmically and in terms of people's uh, just uh, their, their understanding of who you are and what you're about if you keep it up every day. Now, we, not everybody can do literally something every day, but is it much better to do something weekly than monthly? Is it much better to do something monthly than quarterly? Yes, absolutely it is. I think he's right on and so are you. For example, I share a daily Franklin Covey leadership insight on every channel, LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, and I find the cadence of doing it every weekday for several weeks now has helped people become engaged and look for it and comment on it. I think that the consistent engagement, to your point seven times, is super, super uh, relevant. Tell us, how, how does someone find the Dory Clark recognized expert evaluation tool? It's a shorter name, I think, but I love the tool. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> well, thank you. I, I appreciate it. Um, yes, if folks are interested in, in taking the assessment themselves, if they want to see what their score is and, and where they can uh, work on and, and ramp up, uh, you can get it for free. It's at doryclark.com slash toolkit. So at least, at least that part's simple. <laughs> yeah, I recommend it. It's excellent. It took me in total maybe 12 minutes even to digest it. And I will, I love that I printed it off actually because I'm going to go back and look at some of the things, A, how truthful I was when I answered them because I wanted a high score. Uh, no, I did it, I did it truthfully, but it was an excellent tool. Dory, I love the example of Antonio. Share another example of someone who you think is like me or like our audience. They have some followers, they're looking to build a brand, they wanna be known as someone who's adding value, sharing a story that someone else isn't telling. Share another example of someone in your lexicon that's started like a viewer and kind of moved up into being a strong social influencer. What, 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 yeah. what did they do that was maybe replicable? Yeah, you know, there's the, the thing that I love about the people that I profiled in my in my various books, especially uh, Stand Out and, and the latest one, Entrepreneurial You, is that there are so many different paths to be able to, to really break through and be successful, Scott. I mean, I, I was talking earlier about the three principles of content creation and social proof and network, and those remain consistent. But when you think about something like content creation, there's a million directions you could go. It, it could be podcasts, it could be writing, it could be speaking. It's really, you know, what are you comfortable with and where do you excel? And so one story that I especially liked from Entrepreneurial You is about a guy named Todd Herman. And Todd, I, I enjoyed his story because he was somebody that really started out with 
basically no no assets you know meaning he was not well known he did not have a budget to spend he didn't have any famous connections or anything like that he was a regular guy and uh, he lived in Western Canada, so not you know not even a, a metropolitan area really. And what what his deal was? This is a number of years ago. He was a youth sports coach, and he he specialized in youth mindset. So like, how do you how do you master the mental game of sports? And he wanted to build his business. And so you know, like like a smart businessman, he took stock of what he was good at, and he said, well, I, you know, I don't have money, I don't really have connections, but I like speaking. I'm a good public speaker. Let me do that. Yeah. So the first thing he did was he just decided to max it out. So he called up every single youth sports organization in all of Western Canada, you know, anywhere he could drive to. And he said, I will, I will speak to you for free, but there's only one stipulation. For every kid who's in the audience, you need at least one parent to be there. And of course, this was the smart thing, number two, because he realized the, the kids themselves are not the buyers. The parents are the buyers. They have to be in the room. But so he started doing this. He booked 60 talks in 90 days. He was just, you know, rocking it. He was, he was, you know, giving a talk almost every day, driving around. And sure enough, he was able to get clients from it and he was able to get momentum for his business. But something that was very cool and very unexpected for him happened through the talks and just the sheer grit and muscle of doing it, which is that he, after these talks, got approached by a couple of parents and they said, Todd, this is really good stuff. Do you do this for grown-ups too? And he, of course, he didn't. He had never even thought about doing it for grown-ups. But when they asked, he, you know, he's no dummy. He said, "Sure, yeah, I do it for grown-ups." And so, from those speeches, he was able to land his first two adult clients. One was the Canadian government. The other was a National Hockey League team. And so immediately he had started this whole new line of his business with massive social proof because they were these well-known brands. And so today, Todd is a very successful consultant and a coach. Uh, he actually just came out with his first book, which is called The Alter Ego Effect. And it started through his hustle of starting from nothing and doing public speaking. Dory, you're, you're a personal branding expert. What do you think the future looks like? We've talked a lot about social networks and your, your kind of your street cred and telling your own story. Uh, take us out a couple of years. Any insights on what you think is going to are going to be the good the big avenues and what people are going to want to be interested in and follow? Uh, what prognostications would you make? Yeah, I, I think it it is an important question because things are changing so rapidly and, and people always want to know, you know, like what's, what's the next social channel or things like that. I actually, if, if we're kind of giving broader advice, I would say to people that what, what is less important is, you know, which social channel is going to be the next hot thing. I mean, those, those come and go, uh, you see all the time, oh, you know, every, everybody's on, uh, on, you know, oh, Google plus, well, of course, Google plus doesn't exist now. Uh, so it, it, you, you can get invested in something and then it doesn't really quite work out. I remember when Meerkat was very hot, uh, that, yeah. that lasted about 30 seconds. But what I, I do think is critical is the emerging understanding. I think it's certainly already there for people whose businesses has an entrepreneurial bent, um, whether you work for yourself or, or in some capacity you are expected to generate business, that you need somehow to have a compelling reason why people are choosing to do business with you and not someone else. And if the only compelling reason you have is, hey, we're cheaper, that is really not a, a successful proposition over time because someone can always be cheaper. You need to somehow be better but the good news is there are a lot of ways that you can be better, you know, better, better for this or better known for that. Or, you know, you understand the customer better or you have a particular skill set or aptitude or whatever it is. That, that is an important thing, and I think more and more people who have to generate business understand yeah. that. But I especially want to say for people who work inside organizations, it is sometimes uh, it can lull you into complacency. I mean, I know I started my career as a journalist, and I was, I was laid off you know, really abruptly right before 9-11. And it was it was this you know sort of surprising, horrifying thing. You know, oh, you have the steady job, and then now you have nothing. 
But the thing that will always keep you safe, to the extent that one can be safe in, in our modern economy, is having a strong brand. Because if people know your name, if they respect you, if they know not just that you're good, but what you're good at, it means that whatever happens in your career, in your day job, you can bounce back because there are people who want to work with you. And if we can be conscious and cognizant of that, that is how you create true career insurance for yourself over the long term. Dory, final few moments. Uh, think about your own career and your own branding of you and your organization and your you know, particular brand. What's one great decision you made that's helped to build your credibility and your influence and your following? And would you also share in a balance, what's a mistake you made that you maybe overreached or expected a bigger return on something and it fell flat? Share people with our audience, maybe one of each of those. Yeah, certainly, Scott. So one thing that actually proved to be really valuable for me was, and you know, obviously it's it's not really some grand strategy that I had from day one. A lot of a lot of this is is kind of luck and feeling your way, but something retrospectively that I feel like was a good decision and that I would encourage people to do is that early in my career, uh, when I started my, my consulting business, I would say I over-invested in social proof. So meaning I spent a lot of time doing things that honestly were not for much money, sometimes zero money, but they had, uh, they had a kind of aura of prestige around them. Yeah. And that was that was useful because once you have that credibility, and you know, some examples would be writing for Harvard Business Review, which I have done now for about nine years uh, for no money, uh, but but it's a great brand to be associated with. Right. Also, uh, lecturing at universities or, or, or things like that. They're, um, they're very low paid if they're paid at all, but it gives you a kind of credibility that helps later on. And you can, you can leverage that into money in the sense that people see, oh, you've done this, you must be a credible person. Okay, I trust you enough to hire you. So over-investing in social proof early on in your journey is useful. In terms of a, of a mistake uh, to, you know, that, that I've made or, or something that I've focused on a little bit too much, just as kind of one fun example, you know, you, you, you run into things all the time. Um, but I remember early on, I, I was really interested in, uh, in speaking, you know, public speaking. And, I, and that is something now that I, I do a lot. But early on, it's a little bit chicken or egg because you need to have footage of yourself speaking before anyone will actually hire you to speak. You know, obviously they want to vet you and make sure you're okay. And so I decided that I would try to hasten the the process by hiring a videographer to tape me speaking. And uh, so at the time I was, I was teaching at Tufts University. And so I, I decided, I'm like, well, you know, I'll just, uh, I'll just get a classroom. And, uh, you know, some student club brought me in. And I'm like, I'll just speak for them. Okay. So the videographer, I'm, you know, I'm paying her like a thousand bucks or something. She comes in, she films me and, you know, she c cuts the video and all that and at the end, I realized, to my horror, uh, you know, the sounds great. I'm, you know, I'm looking good. I'm looking professional. The students, because it's a student event, they had set up like refreshments. And so I, the whole time, the whole angle, I didn't realize this. And the videographer was like clearly not thinking about this. She filmed me speaking so that the refreshments were visible the whole time. So it was literally like I was speaking at a bake sale. It was like Dory and a big <laughs> bottle of Coke and cupcakes. Optics for <laughs> and, everything, yeah. I'm like, yeah, that's that's really not going to be terribly impressive for uh, Fortune 500 companies. <laughs> great, great insight. Dory, how do clients work with you? Obviously, everyone can buy your book. I highly recommend Stand Out. Visit Dory Clark's website. Download the assessment tool for your influence. How do clients work with you and hire you? Yeah, thank you so much, Scott. So I actually work work with folks in a lot of different ways. One, I was just alluding to, um, I do these days a lot of keynote speaking. Um, I fortunately have moved past the the bake sale uh, phase. <laughs> so you know, last week I was speaking for Royal Bank of Canada. Tomorrow I'm giving a talk for Deloitte. Uh, next week for IBM. Uh, so I, I do a, a lot of speaking. Um, I also do uh, strategy and marketing strategy consulting for companies. And I, I do executive coaching as well, um, specifically around the concept. It's a, a little bit unique compared to other executive coaches. It is specifically around the concept of how do you position yourself as a thought leader in mm. your company mm. or in your yeah. field. Yeah. Um, that's Those are the, the, the big ways. And, uh, and then, of, of course, as I mentioned, I have an online course and community uh, called the Recognized Expert Course. Uh, so that's, that's how I spend a lot of my time. Dory, great conversation. Thank you for your generosity today. 
So pleased you joined us on, on Leadership. Best of luck in your coming keynotes and business. And I think we'll have most of our thought leaders at Franklin Covey, of which there's a dozen. I can call them that. They can't call themselves that. Take your quiz because the quiz is a great assessment for not just reach, but for frequency. So I'll make sure I give you an aggregate score on those when we talk again. I love it. Scott, thank you so much. It's a, a treat to get to, to speak with you today. Dory, same here. Thank you so much for joining. And thank you for listening to today's On Leadership series. Our newsletter comes out every Tuesday via email. If you're not subscribing yet, it's complimentary. Each week it actually sends out to anybody who subscribes. You can find it also at franklincovey.com. Register there. You can also download this interview on all of your favorite podcast channels, Stitcher, iTunes, at Franklin Covey. And we will see you back here on set next week with a new guest. Thank you for joining.